Coming up on Colonial Crossfire. The ISIS threat. Obama's immigration delay. And Scottish independence. Joining us on the left, Frank Fritz. On the right, Alexander Pollock. And I'm your moderator, Kevin Fry. This is Colonial Crossfire. Welcome to Colonial Crossfire, GWTV's political news and debate show. Our student debate panel will join us in just a moment. But first, we can't overlook a summer of seemingly endless breaking news on both the domestic and international stages. A flashpoint in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict over a four-month period. Rocket fire and ground offensives left more than 2,000 Palestinians and more than 70 Israelis dead, many of them civilians. Tensions sparked back in June when three Israeli teenagers were murdered by Hamas members. A revenge killing of a 16-year-old Palestinian by Jewish extremists launched the region into turmoil. After numerous attempts to end the conflict, a permanent ceasefire with no expiration date was reached on August 26th. Nearly 300 people were killed in the downing of a Malaysian Airlines flight over eastern Ukraine. U.S. intelligence and, Dutch, and a Dutch investigation concluded that the plane was likely shot down by a surface-to-air missile. The international community has largely blamed pro-Russian separatists. Russia has denied any responsibility. Stateside, in August, 18-year-old Michael Brown was fatally shot following a confrontation with a police officer in Ferguson, Missouri. Community anger over the shooting escalated to violent protests and looting. The FBI has since launched a civil rights investigation into the shooting and the resulting police action. The Department of Veterans Affairs came under fire after a whistleblower revealed employees falsified wait lists in order to make it seem like more veterans had been treated. Many veterans across the country waited more than a month for an appointment in the VA system. In the Phoenix location, 35 veterans died waiting for care. In the midst of the scandal, VA Secretary Eric Shinseki stepped down. He was replaced by former Procter & Gamble CEO Robert McDonald. As we speak, the U.S. and its allies are taking new measures to combat ISIS fighters in Iraq and Syria. Our student panel is standing by to analyze the U.S. response. On the left, Frank Fritz, a sophomore from New Jersey majoring in history. Frank is the Equal Justice uh, Director for the Roosevelt Institute. On the right, Alexander Pollock, a junior from Florida majoring in political science. Alex is the chairman of the College Republicans. Thank you both so much for joining us. Of course. In recent months, ISIS fighters have captured a territory roughly the size of Belgium across parts of Syria and Iraq. Their brutal tactics have left thousands dead, including two American journalists beheaded in videos posted online. President Obama vowed to destroy the Islamic State through expanded airstrikes. He also said he will send 475 additional troops to the region. As I've said before, these American forces will not have a combat mission. We will not get dragged into another ground war in Iraq. However, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Martin Dempsey, told Congress those troops could take on a different role if the current U.S. tactics prove unsuccessful. My view at this point is that this coalition is the appropriate way forward. I believe that will prove true. But if it fails to be true and if there are threats to the United States, then I, of course, would go back to the president and make a recommendation that may include the use of U.S. military ground forces. So, Alex, turning to you first, will the president have to break his promise? I hope that if the generals tell him he's going to need to break his promise, that he follows through with it and that he listens to his generals, unlike in Afghanistan where he didn't listen to McChrystal and he fought with Petraeus and Admiral Mike Mullen, the former Joint Chiefs of Staff. I hope if there, if there comes a point where Martin Dempsey or one of the other generals says we need some form of ground forces, maybe just special operations forces to combat ISIS on small scales, that where places that airstrikes can't reach, I hope the president's willing to say that for the greater good to protect American citizens, he's willing to put people there, but I'm not sure if he's going to actually go through with that. Now, Frank, part of this whole thing is that ultimately, with the beheading videos, public, the general American public uh, sentiment about going to war is maybe a little less uh, smiteful than it was in the past, but certainly there's still a very much a, exist a, a fear of going to war. But will we go to war? Uh, I definitely think that uh, the president's tried to characterize it as a state of war, at least trying to rally support in Congress for military action using uh, you know, language uh, that would make it similar to that. 
but I don't think that he wants to get uh, embroiled in a ground war that he was elected on a mandate to uh, stay out of. Um, and I don't think that the Iraqi government wants it either. Uh, Prime Minister Haider al-Abadi has stated uh, a few days ago that he does not want uh, coalition ground forces in, an in AP, Iraq. In an AP interview, he said, not only is it not necessary, we don't want them, we do, won't allow them, full stop on any sort of military engagement. Will we have to break that promise, though, if, for instance, at what point should we break that promise? Uh, I think it, you're going to have to break the promise. First off, the Prime Minister of Iraq saying that they don't need help for ground forces. I think it's a bit disingenuous when there's 30,000 ISIS fighters and they have control over large parts of the country. I think it's naive to assume that just airstrikes alone is going to be enough to take them out. And in the long term, I think you probably will have to see maybe just pockets of special operations forces move in. And if we look at some of this, I mean, certainly in in the recent months, Iraqi troops have essentially been dropping their weapons and running away mm -hmm. when ISIS folks have come to town, to put it perhaps a little too nicely. But nonetheless, so it, it, can we even trust to allow the Iraqi troops to be able to combat them from going to Baghdad and other parts of the country? I think what the problem is, is you see, it's the, the ethnic cleavage in uh, Iraqi society. Uh, in the last administration tried to put together a government that was not representative of Iraq as a whole. Uh, Kurdistan was not included. Uh, they still have a lot of grievances. And the Sunni population, a lot of these uh, ISIS fighters and other rebel fighters are former uh, Saddam Hussein um, operatives. So I definitely think that if they need to work on building more support in their own government uh, among their entire territory, I think that this is a problem that a lot of people have just picked up uh, on ISIS because they are better at representing their interests than the uh, Shia government in uh, Baghdad. And Maliki has certainly, of course, said, or now that Maliki is gone, rather, there is now perhaps the opportunity for a more unified government because Maliki was certainly no friend to the Sunnis, at, especially at the later part of his presidency. Turning more on a, a stateside issue, though, we've seen now in Australia 15 men arrested because of an ISIS connection. They were going to do some sort of demonstrative uh, beheading. Is there a threat here in the United States? If that exists, should we be more concerned to do something involving ourselves into the country? Absolutely. You look at the fact that, as I said, there's 30,000 ISIS fighters. There's threats in Australia that they had to deal with because people were going to be beheaded, like you said. And on top of that, they're beheading Americans. They're clearly interested in the demise of America and the downfall of America because they want to establish an Islamic caliphate uh, in starting in Iraq and spreading it through the Middle East to resurrect the, the glory days of the Islamic Caliphate from the Middle Ages. And they see the United States as an obstacle to that because of our influence around the world and our, specifically our influence in the region. So I think, unfortunately, we're going to see p attempts to try and conduct a terrorist attack on the United States. And we're going to have to leave it at that. We'll have to see how this continues to play out in the coming weeks. And we'll be back with more panel debate in just a moment. But first, we'll send it over to G Week anchor Mariana Sotomayor, who joins us with a GWTV news break. Mariana? Thanks, Kevin. Thousands of former colonials came back to Foggy Bottom for the 7th Annual Alumni Weekend. The university hosted more than 60 events, including a Taste of GW, where colonials sampled cuisine from alumni-owned restaurants. Alumni also attended a performance by Rock and Roll Hall of Famers Hall and Oates. One year after the Navy Yard shooting, Washington Police Chief Kathy Lanier says the city still has a lot to learn about how to respond to an active shooter situation. Speaking to a group of GW graduate students, Lanier recounted the events of the tragedy, which left 12 dead and 3 wounded. After years of construction, the long-awaited Science and Engineering Hall is nearing completion. The building is set to open early next spring. It will be home to classes and faculty from the School of Engineering, Medicine, Public Health, and the Columbian College. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg spoke at Lisner Auditorium about women's rights and the Constitution. She, she said she hopes to see the Equal Rights Amendment ratified in her lifetime. Her visit was part of a Constitution Day celebration. Kevin? Thanks, Mariana. Obama postpones executive action on immigration reform. Is it purely politics? We'll ask our panel when we come back. buzz started for me out on the line outside of the Barclays Center, you know, a lot of GW alumni filtering in. I'm just so proud to be an alumni and be a part of this movement. There hasn't been a team like this in seven, eight, nine years. 
I'd say we probably have over a thousand people here and every, you can feel the energy. I graduated in 1991. I graduated in 2009. I graduated in 2005 from Aliens. The School of Medicine and Health Sciences. From the Columbian College. If you want a place to be in the world tonight, it's right here with all of our alumni, students, parents, friends of the George Washington University. It's just important to have a community that supports our student athletes. I love this team and I, you know, I'm proud to support it. Everyone that's participated and made this happen knows it didn't happen overnight. What we're trying to do is develop students and, and student athletes to really impact the world. This is an even better turnout than last year. The first thing it can really do for us is get our name out there. Applications the next year go through the roof. Tonight you are the George Washington University. It raises the school spirit and makes us all proud to be Colonials. And uh, you have really galvanized our whole university community. You're building a spirit and you're building a family within the university stronger than we've ever had before. Gentlemen, go out there and raise high. Crank it up. Raise high. Raise high. Win, baby. Crank it up. Raise high, the buff and blue. Welcome back. Over the summer, the immigration debate took center stage. Tens of thousands of young children entered the United States illegally via the Mexican border. While the surge of unaccompanied children has since ended, Congress still has not passed any legislation to fix the immigration system. Earlier this month, the president said he'll delay any executive action on immigration until after the midterm elections. It's going to be more sustainable and more effective if the public understands what the facts are on immigration, what we've done on unaccompanied children, and why it's necessary. But with Democrats facing an uphill battle in preserving their Senate majority, Frank, is the president simply playing politics? No, I don't think he's simply playing politics. I actually think that uh, he sees immigration as a pressing issue to this nation and that uh, honestly, I think that immigration is an issue that should be uh, addressed after the politics of the midterm itself. I think that he wants to give Congress one more chance. He wants to give Speaker, Speaker Boehner particularly one more chance because they did the Senate did pass a bill. But the Senate bill has been sitting there for a while and it's still not seen the House. Is there any prospect of it seeing it anytime soon? That's up to Speaker Boehner because there are Republicans who are supportive of immigration reform. I think that there's a large contingent of especially uh, business conservatives who want immigration reform. And I think that after the politics of the midterm, uh, we could definitely see during the lame duck session maybe one last chance before the president decides to take unilateral yet sadly temporary action. Well, and that's part of the whole issue is that this is temporary, but I'm going to go back to this simple question, Alex. I have a feeling you don't agree with Frank <laughs> right now. This is politics. Yes, I, I also think it's the extent that political capital is that the president realized that right now the most pressing issue in the now is ISIS and Russia, and he wants to use his political capital with Congress to get them to pass resolutions dealing with ISIS. And I don't think he, f he calculated he'd be able to get an ISIS resolution, a resolution to arm the Syrian rebels, and then get the immigration bill passed. And I think that's honestly why he did it, maybe because of the fact that he just doesn't want to see all three of those fail. He'd rather get the two that he wants and then wait till after the election for immigration. Now, we did see the Senate did already pass, a, pass uh, Senate and the House, rather, pass legislation to arm the, arming moderate Syrian rebels this week. But still, then, I, I have to ask, is there a risk nonetheless if he's not playing politics. But there is still a risk involved inherently if you don't do some sort of immigration reform. You're going to piss off some Democrats as well, are you not, Frank? Absolutely. I think that a lot of uh, activists in the uh, Democratic Party are quite frustrated with the delay. I think they would have wanted unilateral action maybe in the first term, much less than way until now. But I think that after, I think the president made the proper calculation that Republicans were going to try. You saw Marco Rubio reaching out and trying to pass immigration reform. And he, I think he wants that legislative uh, legitimacy uh, when doing such a massive reform such as this. Because it, ultimately, depending on who becomes president next, any of these presidential actions could ultimately just be wiped That's off the table. Yeah. But is there a prospect of Congress getting anything done? It comes down to the commitment to securing the border. You know, we just discussed about ISIS and the threat that they pose to us. Two things on that. First, 
their plans from the bin Laden compound when we raided it showed that al-Qaeda wanted to attack the U.S. via the Mexican border. Yesterday, someone from an immigration interest group said that the border is now a threat for ISIS to attack the United States. So I think that securing the border needs to be the paramount issue, and that's the concern of many Republicans, is that what's going to happen is when, pre and I hate to criticize him, but when President Reagan passed amnesty in the 80s, he didn't secure the border, and there wasn't a, a sustained commitment to secure the border, and that's why we have the same problem we have now, and there's a fear with people that we're not going to secure the border, and 20 years, 30 years down the road, we're going to have to have the same debate, do we let them have amnesty, do we let them stay, and we're not going to make a commitment to secure the border. But ultimately, it's still a systematic issue, is it not, Frank? Absolutely. I think that uh, while securing the border might be, you know, an interest uh, in certain, uh, among certain communities, I definitely think that uh, 15 million uh, undocumented workers definitely are not as interested, especially the, and their families who are citizens and voters in the Democratic Party, are, don't really care as much about securing the border. That's more of an esoteric debate, especially when we've seen that net migration across the border has actually been uh, away from the United States due to the recession. It's relatively close to zero at this yes. point. All right, well, we're going to end that debate right there just because of a matter of time. We're going to move on to some rapid-fire questions and some quick answers to some quick questions. First, the NFL has been engulfed recently in a number of scandals involving criminal activity, including domestic violence and child abuse. Many have called on NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell to resign. So, Alex, should he step down? Yes, I'm a huge NFL fan. I think he should step down. He's mishandled this along with the, head, the concussion issue. Absolutely, he should step down. Frank? Absolutely, he should step down. And as Christian Gillibrand said, I think that Condoleezza Rice should replace him. I think that we need some uh, a women's voice uh, representing this. And I think, honestly, we need more diversity in the NFL. And you wouldn't see problems like this if you know there were more women's voices. In but then the she can't run for president, so I disagree on that. <laughs> Some new blood at the top of the NFL. Absolutely. You heard it here. After weeks of anticipation, the Scottish ultimately def uh, voted against independence, deciding instead to remain part of the United Kingdom. So, Frank, was this a wise move? I definitely think that uh, it's caught that they're taking uh, precautions. Um, uh, they were promised a lot uh, by the British government. Uh, they were promised more autonomy and more devolved power. And uh, if they vo and as a part of voting no to stay in the union, hopefully the Br David Cameron will follow up on that and give them more autonomy in uh, their in governance. The Alex, they didn't know what their currency was going to be. They didn't know if they'd get oil revenue. The banks would probably leave. Absolutely, was the right decision. As interesting as it would have been to see how they would have dealt, and then the reaction of people like the Catalans in Spain if they would have pushed for uh, secession also. So certainly, and ultimately, the whole economics of all of this, oil revenue is not going to last forever in Scotland. The midterm elections are fast approaching, and several Senate seats are up for grabs. Alex, who will control the Senate starting next year? Basing off of uh, guru Nate Silver, I'm going to say the Republicans, and because I have a vested interest in saying that also, <laughs> I definitely think the Republicans will hopefully be able to win a majority in the Senate, but obviously I'm not a, a scientist or anything like that who can do this, so <laughs> every, nothing, nothing is 100% certain. Alex? Frank. Oh, Frank, sorry. Wow. Uh, I definitely think that uh, it's going to be an uphill battle for the Republicans. Uh, you look at a place like Virginia, a state that uh, President Bush in 2004 won by 8 percent. Mark Warner is up 20 percent. This is a year where Democrats won in a wave in 2008. They need a net six seats, then yet they're playing uh, defensive in Georgia, in Kentucky, and in Kansas now. So it's going to be very difficult for them to net six seats, especially having to unseat so many incumbents. So. All right, and, and with that, we're going to end our debate here on Crossfire. Thank you both so much for joining us. Thank After you. this break, Spilled Milk, our wrap-up of late-night comedy. Please stay with us. The George Washington University, at the intersection of policy, practice, and research. Connecting all that Washington has to offer with an intellectual environment that drives progress. Transforming vision into action. Offering learning experiences that are rigorous, real-time, and real-world. In a city shaping the future, George Washington is a place where faculty and students don't just study the world, they work to change it. We're going to turn now to Spilled Milk, our tribute to the best of late night comedy. Take a look. Some more news out of Washington. The White House is opening a new visitor center that will have several exhibits including one about favorite presidential snacks. <laughs> For instance, Harry Truman loved fried chicken, Ronald Reagan liked jelly beans, and President Bush loved Play-Doh. <laughs> <laughs> Red tastes like cherry. 
So I always support our troops, and apparently these are them now. And I would buy each and every one of them a beer or whatever Muslims are allowed to drink. I'm going to say Peshmerga. <laughs> and if we're going into Syria, the key here, of course, is the moderate Syrian opposition, whom the New York Times described as a diverse group riven by infighting with no shared leadership. Well, that's good. Because if movies have taught us anything, it's that a ragtag band of underdogs can overcome any odds. <laughs> I say this war in Syria will be just like Expendables 3, an expensive sequel that no one will want to see. <laughs> Plus, we've got a number of Arab partners. That number? Imaginary. This is just insane. Sarah Palin and her family were reportedly involved in a brawl at a party in Anchorage, Alaska last night. He said Republicans, this isn't the first time she ruined a party. <laughs> Remember that? As Americans, we welcome our responsibility to lead. Yeah, but do we welcome it in this case? <laughs> or is it like when the printer at work runs out of toner and there's no one else around who can fix it? <laughs> oh, shit! Do I really have to take the lead on this again? Nobody else! Nobody else! Welcome back. During our panel discussion, a team of fact-checkers was monitoring our debate. Andrew Desiderio joins us now to fill us in on what we missed. Andrew? Thanks, Kevin. Alex cited an official who said the southern border is under threat by ISIS. However, PolitiFact notes it is highly unlikely that ISIS would operate in Mexico to stage an attack on the U.S. They also note the claims originated from un unnamed sources published by a conservative outlet and could not confirm the claims with law enforcement or other border officials. So the idea that ISIS has planned to come here through Mexico is mostly false. Turning to Frank, he said there are currently 15 million undocumented workers in the U.S. However, according to many estimates, the number is actually closer to about 12 million. Frank also said Democrats do not care about securing the border, that it is purely a Republican issue. This is mostly false, as many recent polls show Almost half of Democrats believe border security should be a top priority. So to say that Democrats do not care about border security is mostly false. That's it for me, Kevin. Back to you. All right. Thank you, Andrew. That's all for this episode of Colonial Crossfire. For all the latest updates from our political team at any time, be sure to follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. For all of us here at GWTV, I'm Kevin Fry. Thanks for getting caught in the crossfire with us. We'll see you next time.